Well, thanks. I'm uh, grateful to be invited to participate uh, in this today. You're going to get a sense as to how the disciplines actually uh, differ stylistically. I've written out a statement, uh, and I'll be reading it reflecting my background in anthropology, I think. Um, uh, but I'm especially interested to participate to hear your thoughts about um, what was put to me in the email invitation um, as a troublesome dichotomy, I think that was the word, that you used between the sciences and the humanities. Um, I don't necessarily want to contest whether that's troublesome or not, but I'm very interested to hear about that perception and to hear more about it. So hopefully afterwards we'll have a chance to talk about that. Um, in return for hearing about your thoughts, uh, I'm pleased to share my own experiences, uh, colored as they are um, by my training in anthropology, which is in the eyes uh, of many people, I think, um, in the academy, a famously undisciplined discipline, um, <laughs> occupied by a pretty unruly bunch of folks. Uh, we have biological anthropologists studying human genetics uh, as colleagues, uh, cultural anthropologists specializing in Derrida, and a lot of folks in between, and as an archeological anthropologist, um, somewhere in between. Um, anthropology is relevant uh, to the discussion today, uh, not just because it has a foot in both the humanities uh, and the sciences, uh, but also because uh, it has pretty hardline representatives of both of uh, those spheres uh, within its boundaries. Uh, and it's for this reason, uh, for example, that anthropology uh, was really positioned at the heart uh, of uh, the so-called science wars uh, of the 1990s, which hopefully many of you have, have uh, heard and thought about. Uh, we felt the sting of those science wars uh, quite acutely. Uh, many of you uh, undoubtedly will have heard of the infamous uh, Sokol affair, um, in which Alan Sokol, um, a physics professor at NYU, uh, he succeeded in convincing the largely anthropological journal Social Text uh, to publish a hoax essay of his, um, uh, which he later described as fashionable nonsense, which is a great way of uh, putting it. Um, and it was hailed by many uh, as a kind of expose of uh, the poverty of rigor uh, in critical studies and cultural studies. Um, that little bomb went off uh, during my first year um, in the PhD program at Michigan in anthropology, uh, which wasn't a really auspicious sign to uh, uh, begin a career as an anthropologist with, um, but it wasn't boring at all. It was quite exciting, I have to say. Um, the core issue uh, of this event, as seen from anthropology, had to do with a debate um, about epistemological authority. Um, so I wanted to give you a bit of background uh, to this. Um, up until the 1980s, uh, anthropologists were generally accustomed um, to writing about their objects of study, non-Western peoples, uh, as if they, um, the, the anthropologists stood in a fairly godlike position outside observers uh, who were able to see through what we imagine to be a kind of fog of illusions, um, uh, a fog of cultural illusions, naive beliefs. Um, it really was uh, that way. Uh, come the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, however, these objects of anthropological inquiry, um, non-Western, largely colonized uh, communities, um, they began to grow very vocal in their opposition uh, to what anthropologists had been doing. Uh, they grew very vocal in their opposition to being treated as experimental subjects. And they began to develop a vigorous critique of anthropology um, that had both political and logical elements to it. It was political because they wanted to um, uh, control how they were represented. This was really a burning issue. But it was also logical insofar as uh, they pointed out that if anthropologists begin with the premise uh, that everyone sees the world through a kind of refracting cultural lens, uh, then that should be true of the anthropologists as much as of the natives. Um, and so it was a mere matter of logic that they wanted us to interrogate our own uh, uh, affairs. Now there's a lot to say about this, of course, um, but I wanted to uh, uh, simply um, uh, note uh, that one of the ways in which I think the humanities generally, and not just anthropology, uh, responded to these challenges uh, was by undertaking uh, a remarkably widespread critical self-examination uh, of, of Western culture itself. Um, a self-examination uh, of what increasingly uh, came to be referred to um, by many scholars as the product of secular modernity. This is one of these kind of key words that arose during that time period. It's a, something to, to ask questions about. 
And this led some in my own field uh, to explore the degree to which uh, the scientific understanding of nature and the natural world uh, can be understood as a distinctively Western construct. And this is the really controversial term that arose during this period. Um, a Western construct that has a distinctively Western genealogy. This was controversial. Um, these were interesting and necessary studies, I think it's safe to say, uh, at the time for our discipline. Uh, but it wasn't long before anthropology departments found themselves in the very awkward position of uh, suddenly um, having uh, both those who were studying culture as uh, a product of nature, of evolution, uh, sitting around a table with those who uh, viewed nature as a product of culture um, or of history, uh, both uh, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, seeking to undercut the other, um, each kind of claiming that they had a firmer grasp on reality. No, is that two minutes? Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, much of the bluster uh, of those debates uh, is over, it's quieted down, um, although I think that's due to fatigue more than the fact that they actually <laughs> resolved anything. Um, uh, I kind of view this as a Cold War period uh, that we're in more than anything else. Um, We've seen uh, um, certainly a lot of emphasis uh, in the academy recently on uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, um, very much in support of this sort of thing. Uh, but from my position as an anthropologist, where we have a difficult time having intradisciplinary conversations, um, I'm oftentimes suspicious um, uh, uh, of uh, you know, the goals that are laid on the table. We've seen departments split apart. Um, famously, Stanford's uh, Department of Anthropology in 1998, uh, splitting into a Department of Anthropological Science on one hand, uh, and a Department of Cultural and Social Anthropology on another. Uh, there we were, they were returned back uh, together uh, a few years ago for economic reasons, not because they wanted to be uh, back together. You know, where does that leave them? I don't know. Here uh, at Columbia, of course, um, we uh, um, had our own sort of split. Uh, with many of the more scientifically work, uh, oriented uh, anthropologists uh, shifting over to E3B. Um, and our program became much more focused on the humanities uh, as a result. And I should actually uh, um, note that the alliance here at Columbia became very much between uh, anthropology and history, um, which created a new space for new kinds of conversations, uh, but one that's quite different than many of my archaeological colleagues at other universities are having, um, where their allegiances are much more towards biologists, for example. So I merely wanted to throw out there a kind of image um, of a world in which the polarizations which Snow talked about, and I was grateful to have a chance to actually read that, it was quite interesting, um, that those polarizations I do feel like are real. Um, and in some departments, especially anthropology, um, uh, uh, those that sit right on that contested border zone, um, we're still see, seeing um, uh, quite a bit of factionalization. Um, the question, I think, in the end, uh, is whether we're to view these kinds of debates um, and uh, the sort of disciplinary realignments that are happening um, as tragic, and we could view them as tragic, um, or as exciting, we could view them as exciting. Um, we could view them as a breakdown in conversation, or we could view them as a set of invitations to new sorts of conversations. Um, I'm not going to try and weigh in one way or the other. I'm a junior faculty member. It would be foolish of me to do so. Um, uh, but I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you.